Hi, I'm Matt Lieb. And I'm Vince Mancini. And this is Pod Pod Yourself yourself The the Wire. Wire. A The Wire podcast where Vince Mancini and I go through every single episode of The Wire and And talk talk about about it. it. Hell yeah. So glad you guys could all join us once again for the world's only The Wire podcast. Uh, Of course, a reminder up top. Give us five stars and a review. A reminder, um, you know, go on Spotify, subscribe, and then you can you can write little comments under episodes. Mm. It's got like a comment section now, sort of. So you can do that. Um, Finally, March 17th, Sunday, March 17th in Sacramento, me. And my wife, Francesca Fiorentini, are going to be headlining the Sacramento Punchline. Uh, It's at 7 p.m. Ticket link will be in the bio. So please, bio some tickets. Mm. (laughs) Oh, geez. You'll hear jokes like that and much, much more if you go to the Punchline March 17th, 7 p.m. That's a Sunday. It's actually St. Paddy's Day. So Mm -hmm. celebrate your drunken Irish heritage with us if you are Irish. Or celebrate, you know, just getting drunk for fun if you're not Irish, you know? Yeah, I do that. Hell yeah. I know. You do it all the time. You're not even... Are you Irish? No. You feel Irish. Mm. Well, moving on. Today we're talking about... (laughs) (laughs) From season five of The Wire, episode three, we're talking not for attribution. And our guest today is a returning Pod Yourself champion, uh, talked about... The Sopranos with us uh, now is talking about The Wire with us. Uh, you heard him here. You've seen his journalism all over the journalistic world, the world of journalism. And of course, this is a season about journalism. So we are talking with our favorite journalists and or news people. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone else, our guest today is Dave Weigel. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. This is hell. The most depressing season for people in my industry. So awesome to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's why we brought I mean, you is on. Is it worse man? than reality? I feel like it's depressing, maybe because it's like it, it seems so terrible then, and then you watch it now, and you're like, oh, they still kind of had it good a little bit. Oh, oh we'll, we'll get into that. It's like watching one of those movies where World War One is over, and everyone says, "Well, let's not do that again." <laughs> it, it, it feels like watching that. We've all learned our lesson, right? Yeah, sure yeah. have. Yeah, it is. um, I mean, it's one of many things, um, you know, plot lines in The Wire where you kind of, upon rewatch, looking at this show from 20 years ago, you go like, oh, art doesn't do anything. (laughs) <laughs> like you know you kind of go I mean, like oh, i don't maybe... think we were under any pretenses even at the time but there was a time i was pretty sure that like art changed the world like if you can just like get a show out there that shows what it's actually like it'll change the mm. hearts and minds of people and change will happen and like uh i mean this show was ahead of the curve on a lot of stuff that is uh still pretty like uh you know our modern foibles and uh everything worse now mm. i'd say but dave do you like the wire i love it i i i do think in the the prestige tv show what's the best one ever dialogue i i yeah. usually go with the, the sopranos mm-hmm. uh but and, and and even even at its very best the wire just has this much more get it get it sort of dialogue that i i I appreciate but it's it's i don't i don't find myself going back to with exception this episode we'll get some stuff this episode i think is very funny i don't find myself going back and laughing about it as much as i do the the sopranos uh but these are well-drawn characters but they have morals usually and that's not as fun as the sopranos yeah 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 i mean listen the sopranos obviously mostly a comedy pretending to be a prestige drama Whereas The Wire um, is a show that's pretending to be a cop show, but is actually a very long lecture series that you can <laughs> watch. Yeah, it about the you... death of the mid- middle-sized American city. Yes, exactly. But, you know, it's like uh, if you've ever taken any classes at uh, Harvard Extension, you know, you'll mm-hmm. probably... That's what this show... It's like <laughs> a Harvard <laughs> Extension class. Um, but... Dave, I want to ask you about this season because this is the most polarizing season, I think. I I think, um, or maybe not so much polarizing. It's more that 
uh like season two was polarizing right it's like the docs people some mm -hmm. people hated it and some people decided actually it might be the best season it seems that season five is universally hated what what about you do you did you, did you like season five when you saw it I did. I remember in real time going along with some of the consensus because when I was watching this season, I usually watched if I was home on Sundays, I, I lived uh, in a house with two other reporters and we were across the alley with, from a house of another of a few other reporters. Hell yeah. And we yeah, we, we doing different stuff. One was a national security reporter. One guy was like, you know, political blogger. I was covering politics, etc. But yeah. we all had some you guys idea your... what the. Did you guys have Sorry? your little fedora with the press tag like on a rack like next to each other? Each each person. Yeah. How did you not get them mixed up? Yeah, the the fedora with the press tag. Well, it was like the the magic castle where you have to you have to wear you know jacket and a fedora on the way in if you right, want right. if you want to party. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, Whose cape is this? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, we all at the time were in the media, and uh, we were not as sensitive as people other people we knew who were newspapers about, about about that part of the topic but we all we all felt like the season had lost a few things mm. uh, and i i'm including myself in this and the the critique i i agree most with that you see made online is uh that mcnulty after all his character development uh backslides yeah. as a old person who has a, like not backslid i'd say but has uh -huh. achieved some things and done some personal growth and then fallen back I, that doesn't bother me anymore. It feels feels pretty realistic. Yeah. There, there's a little more cartoonishness in some of the character development, um, but everyone's very desperate. And actually, I think this season, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't do a full slate pitch hot take on how this is the best season. I do think that now that we live in a world of clickbait and fallen newspapers with no one working for them uh, and being impossible to get anything covered unless it's flashy and conflicted. Mm -hmm. I feel like this, this season's gained a lot of, a lot of resonance and yeah. uh, just watching everyone be really pathetic and have to lie to get what they want. Uh, that if it felt weird or wrong at the time, it feels like it feels correct now <laughs> like with yeah. the discussion yeah. they, not just this episode but all the discussions of oh what we need what do we do to get people to actually pay attention to this problem how do we right. cover up this lie so that the guy the the, the america get re elected governor uh I, it feels i wouldn't say prophetic but it's pretty close pretty close to that yeah i feel like the people that want to say that uh they thought mcnulty had like grown beyond where he is at this season are kind of the mm -hmm. maybe the same people that were like disappointed by the Carcetti arc like I feel like right. those mm -hmm. the seeds of those characters were kind of there all along and like I mean the right. fun of it was like watching them convince you that they were someone else for a little bit but right. I don't yeah but like the the clues that that they never actually made any progress are sort of there yeah it's it's uh I think there is uh, if it, when you're first watching the show, I think it is hard to um, I don't fault anyone for hating the fifth season the first time they watched it, only because they had kind of like built up an expectation of what the show was. And it very much wasn't like TV TV, whereas like um, the fifth season, they're they're going for like, hey, this is television, so we can just have an arc where jimmy invents a uh you know serial killer yeah right? i mean i i like that kind of writing where you know someone is at their end of the the rope from mm -hmm. something and then they make a big they take a big swing like they're pushed against the wall and then they and then the big swing of course is you know something that is a little bit more fantastic like necessarily but that's like that's usually like a fun jumping off point for good stories is like someone who's in a shitty situation and they uh and they take a big swing like inventing a serial killer and i mm -hmm. want drunk mcnulty yeah listen if, if mcnulty had just like been completely cured of being a you know pussy hound uh and and a smart ass a smart ass uh, you know, in the fourth season and then in the fifth season, he's just like married now and like goes to church. I, I would have been pretty disappointed in that. Instead, I like that, you know, that, you know, every time he thinks he's out, they pull him back in, you know, it's, mm. uh, I mean, we get a scene here of him flashing his police badge uh, as two cops <laughs> shine a light on him while he's railing a woman he met in a bar. That's the yeah. McMultin ultimate one. If you're complaining about this season, uh, you got to explain that away. That's a great it, scene. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You really, you can't pretend 
that the show should be doing something else when when what it's doing is just brilliant. Now look at this. This is, I saw, this is hold on. Sorry, good. We're gonna show that scene. Look at this I mean, God bless him. See, it's funny because, like, the first time I watch that scene, I think that she's embarrassed because some other cops, uh, you know, like shine a spotlight on her and caught her getting railed on the on the hood of a car. Right. But then I realize that she's just annoyed with McNulty for stopping, and she's like, "Hey, <laughs> why did you stop thrusting? I was almost there." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. But yeah, we'll get into all of that. But of course, we cannot start the podcast officially without first playing the season five theme song. When you pause to the garden, gotta pause. watch your back. Well, I beg your pod. Pod. Straighten podcast. The track. <laughs> Podcast with Jesus is gonna say the newsroom. Can I keep a fake serial killer? Pod down in the hole. <laughs> Season five. Uh, <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone else. All right. Once again, we are talking about from season five. Episode three, not for attribution. Uh, episode came out January 20th, 2008. Vince, break mm. us off a little piece of that episode synopsis. Oh, I forgot to write it down. Hold on. Let me let me grab off it. Off top of your head. Off top of your head. Oh, what happened? Uh, uh, hold on. Uh, you can well, do it. You yep. just watched it. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, McNulty invents a fake serial killer. Yeah. Well, and the plan is one, going... Swim, swimmingly, uh-huh. uh, Marlo learns how to launder money, and uh, Michael takes Dookie uh, to a field trip at the amusement park. I love it. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you pretty much got it. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. So that's what happens. But Vince, more importantly, yes, uh, we need to talk about what happened uh, mm-hmm. when this episode came out. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, as we like to say, we cannot evaluate art divorced from its cultural context. We got to put some of that cultural context back in. And we do that with a little something that we like to call the back in the day machine. It's a bad time for newspapers. The news hole is shrinking as advertising dollars continue to decline. There ain't no back in the day machine tells the tale, son. I mean, it's wild that we're doing the episode from which you got this very segment that we've been doing for. I know, I know. Finally, five, we, five seasons. We're we, here. We finally are here. Yeah. You, everybody's gonna do the DiCaprio pointing gift. To, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That, love that. Um, we're going all the way back today to January twentieth, two thousand eight, uh, year of our Lord. Some of the headlines: uh, Super Pats still perfect. That's from Super the New Pats. York Post. Yeah. Oh, the Patriots. That's right. Uh, is this the season? God, it, it feels like it wasn't that long ago. Is this the season where they had a almost perfect season, but then lost it at the Super Bowl? That's right. But people don't know that yet. Now they just think that this is the Super Team. Uh, yeah. Foxborough, Massachusetts. The Patriots looked far from perfect in yesterday's AFC Championship game, but were good enough to dispatch the Chargers. Now they are one step away from immortality. New England advanced to Super Bowl. Uh, what is that? 42, I think. Uh, uh, you with- think I know Roman numerals? <laughs> we Just- forget them until the Super Bowl every year. Yeah, uh, say the a, letters. X, with a tw- extra X, large. XL deuce. Extra large, two. Yeah, two XL. Uh-huh. Okay. With a 21-12 uh, defeat of San Diego at Gillette Stadium, they became the first team in NFL history to be 18-0. and Um. Yeah, they won despite an uncharacteristic three interceptions from normally perfect Tom Brady. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 but the Chargers yeah. couldn't take advantage. Um, yeah, and then we all know what happened after that. Uh, yeah. There was the helmet catch, 
and I had to listen to that awful Alicia Keys Jay Z song for like an entire year straight. And uh, is that I'll the never... New York one? Yeah, Empire State the, of Mind about the concrete jungle where mm-hmm. dreams are made. She's she's crying for some reason, or it sounds like she's crying. It always sounds like she's crying. By the way, if you uh, if you have time after the podcast, there's video today of New York City showing off a new. Uh, trash collection system and just blasting that song as as the trash <laughs> the trash dumpster is loaded into a, into a truck. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, you got to be proud of your city, and sometimes it's just about how good the trash you know is. That's, I do. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've I've have a vivid memory of like <laughs> coming out of a house party. I think it was in like. Hoboken, uh, right mm. after the Giants had won that game, and it, it had just started to snow, and there was like a a fire. I can't remember if it was a fire truck or an ambulance that was speeding by, and I was like, "Oh shit, somebody must be hurt!" And then they drove by, and there was just firemen like leaning out the windows, like honking the horn, celebrating the uh, the victory. <laughs> that I mean, hey, that rules. Yeah, it was a good moment, and then yeah. and then the stupid song started playing, and I was like, "Ugh." <laughs> I have no idea how tired of the song I'm going to be in a month. Um, Hindsight. Yeah. Other, we got other football news. Uh, Great. There was, yeah. Yeah. Look, these are good football stories. This one ties into current events because, you know, Ooh. now these days we got Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey and that's driving a whole news cycle. But back in January 2008, we had Tony Romo and Jessica Simpson and oh. we had the New York Post sending a fake Jessica Simpson to hex uh, the Cowboys. Um, Tony, Ro- that's a guy who make a uh, place for ribs? <laughs> Tony Romo? No, that's, that's Tony Roma. Oh, right, right, right. So yeah. Tony Romo, football guy. Football guy. Who His also hands made ribs. may have been slippery from the ribs, and that's why he <laughs> that's fumbled why that he, snap he fumbled, that one time. Yeah. yeah. New York Giants fans are crediting an imported Jessica Simpson lookalike with putting the whammy on real-life Simpsons boyfriend, Cowboys QB Tony Romo, who threw an end zone interception with nine seconds to play that cemented the Giants' 21-17 upset victory in Sunday's NFC playoff game. Seems the New York Post hired the fake Jessica, boffle nanny Lindsay Nordstrom, 21, and flew her to Dallas for the big game, putting her in a... What what nanny? The boffle? Bothel? Is that Both. a town in New York somewhere? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know anything or is it about. in Texas? I don't know what Bothell is, but her, also yeah. her name is I, Lindsay, I, I, Lindsay I Nordstrom, your, which sounds I, incredibly fake. I met your mom in a Bothell. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I stepped on that. I, I kind of knew that's where you're going with it, but... <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Hold on. I got to look up Bothell now. Yeah, look it up. Oh, uh, it's, it's in Washington it's... State. How would we know that? <clears throat> anyway. How would anyone who reads the Post know that? But it is interesting that uh, I, you know, I totally forgot about how uh, Jessica Simpson, another blonde, beautiful, uh, you know, pop singer who of a specific time, who also dated a uh, famous football player. You know, it just like goes to show that like, you know, the uh, the intelligence football. state really doesn't stop. You know, they recycle um, the same psyops over and over. That's right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get a Dave, thing. do you think it's a psyop? <laughs> yeah, I was at a conference this week, the uh, Turning Point USA conference, where Oof. this came up multiple times, uh, <laughs> and, and and they were not the guys organizing were not that happy that this is the thing that people kept noticing. But uh, from the audience, somebody asked Charlie Kirk if this is a psyop, and Jack Basobiec was explaining that uh, he had a whole th- theory of how this is going to work. It, I was a, it was crazy how widespread this is. Uh, the, this idea, right? Like, uh, I don't think it is. For the record, I don't. I don't think it's a psyop. <laughs> I don't I even. Can, what's the I, end game? <laughs> I can understand why yeah. they think it's a psyop, and I feel like it's Wait, related why? because, like, there's it's just not convenient. Yeah, well, there's just right, no yeah. news stories anymore. So we have like, oh, <laughs> oh, we have like no one. That's true. Like we, I don't know why that I hear about just, uh, what's her name? Taylor Swift, like yeah. seven times a day. Like I don't do anything to seek it out. And, yeah, and you're not like, there's no, there's no reason that it should affect my life in any way. But I somehow like still hear about her because we only have like five trending topics a day. And that's what all <clears> the stories are about. Sure. So I feel like if you're just a random person somewhere and you keep hearing about Taylor Swift, you're naturally going to be like, why the fuck do I keep hearing about Taylor Swift 17 times a day? There's no logical reason for this. Yeah. I mean, I guess so, but I just feel like 
what what the, I don't know what the end game is. Like I get I get thinking it's a psyop because most people are like clinically depressed, <laughs> and so it's like you know you just like you see this hot young ish happy couple, um, and uh, you're just like. Oh, the government's trying to make me mad. I get that. But why? I don't understand why. What does it do? I guess uh, it, like, because she's anti-Trump or something. It's like uh, the psyop is that There's people that, will and vote for Biden because Ke they, they love Taylor. Well, Kelsey, Travis Kelsey did, did Pfizer commercials. So now they've, like, they've, they've worked it into a, a worldview. And some of this is just sputtering and covered up. Because three weeks ago, four weeks ago, a lot of the same people pushing the psyop were saying there's no way a vaccinated player can get to the super bowl sure it, they're even doing something like the <laughs> samson and delilah um mindset of that he was doing work the, the, the chiefs are doing worse because he was having sex with taylor swift uh <laughs> and they had to they had to get past that okay well now they're in the super bowl what can we say now the fact that they're in the super bowl uh, shows that the cia yeah, operating with the world economic forum is yeah. pushing taylor swift this is a uh, I, I, I've been avoiding this all week, but but this also yeah, it just reboots every week because the the yeah. knock on Swift from these people from these folks I guess a month before this was or before the Kelsey dating thing was the the man is pushing Klaus Schwab is pushing Taylor Swift on you because she wants all women to be um, ch childless unmar unmarried and unhappy and that's what Taylor Swift is teaching. Oh, she has a hot football player boyfriend. New thing. We got to go to the yeah, new yeah, thing yeah, right yeah. now. Pivot, pivot, pivot. Well, also, yeah. like, I don't know, eight years ago, Taylor Swift was, like, the uh, the ideal, like, Aryan woman right. who was, like, unfairly being, uh, like, outsold by, you know, these, uh, like, Black artists? Yeah, basically. Like Beyonce and stuff? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. yeah. No, I, she was I, pushed for... into, like, commenting on politics, if I recall, because there were all these memes about her secretly being a MAGA Aryan princess. Mm, yeah. And she finally said, oh, actually, I'm not. I love uh, uh, the guy who's running against Marsha Blackburn. But, but, right. took, but she she talked about that. She didn't want to endorse Hillary because, I think correctly, <laughs> she, yeah. she, was, she worried that endorsing Hillary would feed into this narrative of celebrities trying to tell you what to think. And here, here we friggin' are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, she... Uh, and she, has, she, she hasn't she endorsed anyone right yet, call right? There. Like, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> she hasn't endorsed anyone. Like, they're, they're doing this all, like, on the assumption that she will no she's uh, just and, fucking a football player and is like now yeah. going to games and people are like why is she there and i was like i've never seen a more football girlfriend looking ass woman <laughs> than taylor yeah. swift like yeah. what do you mean what is she doing there she's not an eyesore you're not just like what do you mean her it's it's so weird man i i listen I, as someone who has been like, I don't know, marginally tape hilled, uh, meaning <laughs> I, there's some of her music that I think is fucking amazing. Um, I, I just, the, she gives you no good reason to hate her. Like even her like politics stuff is pretty fucking tame, you know? So I feel it's, like at this it's point, tame. it's tame. Yeah. It's, it's tame with a capital T A Y. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kill myself. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> my point being that, like, uh, the only reason that they hate her is because, um, like, football is supposed to be a safe space. Like, there's we're getting close to, like, a Gamergate type yeah, thing. Yeah, well, everything's Gamergate it, now. It's, but, it's, yeah. it's ethics and football journalism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I got a kicker for this story. Oh. Uh, I knew we were going to win when I saw her. I'm dead serious, said a Giants fan Anthony Chilia, who then told her, you have to come <laughs> to Green Bay. Responded the pseudo Simpson staying in character, what's Green Bay? Hmm. <laughs> That's cool. Great. cool, cool, cool oh, cool. that's right. Because she was dumb. That was she the whole dumb. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah. was like, uh, that was uh, she had a whole show where she was like, she didn't know what tuna was or something. Yeah, yeah. She thought it was chicken. Of the sea was chicken. That's fun. Uh, yep. Um, we got news from Sundance where Tom Hanks and Robert De Niro both have new movies premiering at some Sundance. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this. Wait, wait. Two thousand seven, Sunday. Two thousand eight. Yeah. Yeah, 2008, right? Uh, Robert De Niro and Tom Hanks, not in the same movie. Mm -mm, different movies. Okay. Robert De Niro, he is premiering um, Meet the Fockers, and Tom Hanks is premiering um, the uh, shelved project uh, Forrest Gump Two: The Rise of Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dave, uh, any guesses? In 2007, 
the Tintin Tin movie was that was that oh, what they're Tin prepping Tin. for? Not a bad guess, but yeah. no. Yeah. Uh, for Tom Hanks, he's got uh, the great Buck Howard. The film's title role is played oh. by a flamboyant John Malkovich as a cheesy celebrity mentalist who doesn't seem to realize that the 1960s are over. The great Buck. Uh, I don't even fucking know. He's assisted in his comeback attempt by his new road manager, played by Colin Hanks, and a publicist portrayed by the delicious Emily Blunt. Oof. Wait, what, uh, yeah. Why, why, why do you have to make her delicious? <laughs> yeah, she's not food. Just, Calm just down. Trying to eat Emily uh, Blunt. If anything, you <laughs> smoke Emily Blunt. You know, <laughs> this is what's been when lost. This is what's lost when news newspapers buy out the older journalists who just that's yeah. right throw sexism in every single article. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, for, yeah. Yeah, this is Lou Luminic, who I'm pretty sure is still working, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Never mind, he was... he's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just always horny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a couple hours later, another showbiz expose. <clears throat> the much anticipated "What Just Happened" premiered at the same venue. A collaboration between Hollywood heavyweights Barry Levinson and producer Art Linson. It stars De Niro as a producer trying to salvage an arty thriller starring Sean Penn, who plays himself and trying to persuade Bruce Willis to shave off a beard for an about-to-shoot picture. At the same time, the producer is mooning over his ex-wife. Yeah. That movie I remember just because it has one of those stupid posters uh, that, that sticks in your, in your head. Mm. It, it shows up in theaters and you never watch the thing. It's like De Niro with a movie ticket on his mouth. Yeah, uh, looking, I do remember looking, that. Looking nonplussed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was like a it was it's a very like Ricky Gervais comedy show flyer looking kind of poster. Like he Why the looks fuck like do he's I being he this. looks like he's being censored somehow. And I do it's very, remember it's a very damn can he say that sort of ad campaign. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't I never saw this movie, I don't think, but I do remember that Bruce Willis was playing Alec Baldwin uh in about an incident that actually happened where they were trying to I think they were trying to get Alec Baldwin to shave off his beard because no one would recognize him, and it was a whole mm. thing. Yeah, two thousand eight. Um, yeah, so that's. Uh, I feel like we're all property, we're properly, all... property, properly contextualized now. We we understand what was happening in the world, so now mm-hmm. we understand the wire. That's and right. That's an important yeah. thing to do. Um, it's weird. I don't remember any of those movies. It was two thousand eight. I was high on drugs so <laughs> that is now i'm now remembering oh yeah i didn't know i didn't know a lot of what was going on i didn't get sober <laughs> till 2009 so 2008 real blur for me um still in a haze hey speak, speaking of uh rocking out um this week's balmer b story um oh, yes. it, it, it's like it sucks like uh, a, a lot of them suck, i don't believe you but uh this is um well, uh, <clears throat> I'll just play it. This is based on Black Hole Sun. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's choking. All right, yeah. So Aww. then you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear the rest of the song at the end of the episode. Look, Chris Cornell's got some pipes. It's kind of kind of hard to replicate that. I know it's hard. Listen, <laughs> but I w- I feel like I was able to do it when I did one of those audio slave songs, and and then this one I was like trying real hard and I was straining, but. Balmer did, did you do the whole thing? Because that's one that has one of those outros that lasts eight minutes. Yeah, I do the whole yelling. thing, and Excellent. I, uh, I, you know, whenever there's like a an a, a long outro or like an instrumental uh, breakdown or some sort of like guitar solo, that's when I start freestyle rapping. So listen to the full song good, good, good. at the end of the episode, and you can hear maybe one of the worst I've ever done. But hey. Who gives a shit? All right. <laughs> this is a Balmer Sun heavy episode. Uh, McNulty really wants to get his fake serial killer on A1 above the fold. And uh, he keeps uh, doing his best and it gets buried. Um, and then we have uh, Scott Templeton continuing his lies, continuing his, uh, his, his pattern of making shit up. Uh, we have Marlo, who is, uh, you know, talking to the Greeks, I think, behind Prop Joe's back. I'm not entirely sure. Yes, uh, it's and behind then, his back. 
and then we have uh yeah we we have mcnulty uh you know with the ribbon we have carchetti with firing burrell maybe a lot of stuff happens let's talk about it vince what uh did you think about this episode i mean obviously we got a tale of two weasels here we mm-hmm. have scotty templeton uh the weasel that just wants to suck up to his bosses and and mcnulty the weasel who desperately wants to fuck over the bosses and they're sort of uh they're like literary foils because they're both cutting corners and, and right. it's probably going to catch up to them um and then you know it ends with like one of the most depressing uh the wire scenes ever where they just uh, decided to torture and murder blind butchie for some <laughs> yeah. reason so i i don't know if 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 that scene is like the reason that people are uh, cold on the fifth season of the wire, I guess I can't really blame them. That was not super fun to watch, but I do love, uh, I love the two, two weasels mirroring each other. Very enjoyable to me. Yeah. Dave, what'd you think of this episode? I love this one. I mean, you, you set up the dynamic and this, this has some of the, there, there are many weaselly Scott Templeton scenes. This has (laughs) probably my favorite, of him just uh, getting dunked on instantly <laughs> by yeah. Clark, Clark Peters when he hands hands the uh, Cedric Daniels scoop over to him. He promises he can get to it. And then Twig, the reporter, just took the buyout. Knows yeah. everything up top, top to bottom about the entire story. <laughs> Including who he's dating. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, what's his favorite color? And yeah. it's... Uh, Scott says, I would have had that story surrounded in two hours. <laughs> oh, I love that part. No, because he's he he for any reporter watching the show is uh, half the half the newsroom characters are really cartoonish villains. But he's so scummy that I, I love watching him work or yeah. not work, I guess, is, is the, is the yeah. term for it. And yeah, the big McNul- McNulty stuff like this is has the the some of the funniest stuff uh, in this season, which isn't that funny of a season of him, him bumbling his way into getting investigation, of the fake homeless, home, yes. homeless uh, murders, including him just loudly talking about the office, thinking that he's intrigued another cop who just leans over and farts. Uh, <laughs> yeah, great scene. My favorite scene. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I, like, I love yeah. the fact that like he it's very relatable in that he's trying to figure out how to do a scheme and uh, like the first his, he realizes his rough draft has assumed that everybody is way smarter and more competent than they actually are. And he's like, shit, we got to go back to the drawing board because yeah, yeah, everybody yeah, yeah, is yeah. really stupid and lazy and no one actually I feel like that's a, a lesson for life is that no one is paying as much attention to you as you think. And yes. you really have to beat him over the head with shit. This might be, I think, one of the funniest episodes of The Wire that there is. Uh, It was like one of the it's one of the rare episodes where I kept uh, laughing out loud, which, you know, is not it. You know, the show can be funny, but I I get most of my laughs on a conceptual level on stuff that I don't even think was intentional. This was a lot of intentional laughs. This was like when um, when McNulty wants to see if his story's in the paper. <laughs> yeah, there's this yeah, yeah. small brief exchange when he steals the newspaper. Ooh. There. Hey. Yeah. Cheap motherfucker. <laughs> 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 just mad at him. <laughs> you cheap motherfucker. And just like there's just so many moments in this in this episode, uh like you said, uh Barlow farting um fucking um you know uh, the shit between bunk and jimmy is like pretty funny the ending where jimmy uh is in the box with freeman and bunk bunk oh, thinking God, that yeah. freeman's gonna talk some sense into him <laughs> yeah. and he just says fuck it it's the last season i'm going for it <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that is a hilarious misdirection and that is like such a funny scene there's just this you know this i feel like the reason people think this is the worst season is because there weren't more seasons of this show uh in which um, and like some of your favorites die like it's inevitable well, sure. that you're not like that uh, sure but what i guess what i was gonna say is that like i almost feel like upon rewatch the fifth season is when they decided, okay, let's make it a little bit of a TV show. And I actually think it works. I, yeah. I think people are mad at it because it's such a, it's such a tonal shift, but 
if there had been more seasons like this where they allow for kind of like a little bit not grandiose but like a little bit more outside of the box plot lines i don't think people um i think people would have dug it you know i think people I, yeah will, I, I did i, I also know. think I, I it's still it. it's still on brand in that it's very like prescient and bleak yes. at the same time and like nailing you with you know like david simon is giving you his ted talk yeah. and uh and it's a good ted talk um mm -hmm. but like watching this even that scene where mcnulty steals the newspaper like yeah he's painting a world uh you know where like the newspaper the news hole was shrinking and and all of it is like insanely relevant right now but at the same time you're all also watching it and you're like fuck we barely even have newspaper dispensers like that any, <laughs> yeah, anymore that like, doesn't exist literally don't yeah do you see now and they're just not anywhere you sometimes see like an epic times uh box yeah. and that's about it yeah uh i don't even know if they have like the uh the LA porn mag dispensers, uh, huh. like they used to be everywhere. It would just be like, you get your LA weekly, you get your LA times, and then you could get your LA express. And that was just like advertisements for escorts. And like, occasionally they wouldn't blur out a boob that much. And so you could see a little bit of a boob. And so you would collect them and you could get a box that you could put them in. Uh, but under your like, bed, I feel like so no the second person's them. doing a lot of work I'm not done talking. I'm not done talking. You would put them in a box <laughs> under your bed, and then you would hide them just so in case so no one else could also look at them. And yeah. then when the time was right and the hour was struck midnight, you could take them out. You could look at them, and then other things could happen. But the point being, <laughs> um, there's just that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and then you know he's having the, the there's the big meeting and i feel like we've seen this scene in fiction several times like succession had a i think it was like a, a take on rupert murdoch did that at one point where he like oh yeah like br brought some boxes out and he stood on top of them like here we got uh, the uh the owner like standing on a desk and, and giving the speech about the news hole yeah. is shrinking. And then his next annou announcement is like them closing like the Beijing bureau. <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck? I have the Baltimore scene. sun had a Beijing bureau, like barely <laughs> yeah. 15 years ago. What the fuck? Yeah. It really is a different time in a uh, different print, world print news media just because yeah, he, well, let me, let me play the scene. It is a, uh, it's Whiting, um, you know, announcing with great regret um, what's going to happen to the Baltimore Sun. Just regret that I tell you that Chicago has made it clear that the bureaus in Beijing, Moscow, Jerusalem, Johannesburg, and London will all be shuttered. Elsewhere in the newsroom, there will be a fresh round of buyouts. We are quite simply going to have to find ways to do more with less. It is crazy to me that the Baltimore Sun had, or just like any newspaper that wasn't um, the New York Times, you know what I mean? Like had offices in anywhere else outside, like anywhere outside of America. I mean, it makes sense that that was the thing that happened, but you just don't, uh, I don't know. I, you don't even consider that. I was, I was talking with a friend um, who was a journalist for KPFA um, uh, going, uh, covering a lot of like Israel Palestine stuff in like the early two thousands. And she was talking about how often she would go over, you know, to uh, the West bank and whatnot, fly from the Bay area to the West West bank um, to cover news and i was just like someone paid you to to do to fly to, to, to do go journalism? do news yeah, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. just like i don't know it sounds insane well, to me it's yeah like th this scene ha probably happened to uh, 500 people just this week but instead of yeah the baltimore sun saying they're going to close the beijing journal it's the fucking wall street journal saying they're going to cut the washington bureau like down <laughs> in an election year like it's, it's like the, it's the same wall street thing, journal but cutting so out much the, wa worse. the wall street bureau <laughs> <laughs> yeah like yeah wait so wait what oh, happened yeah, this, yeah dave and, you were and, you were talking oh, about this, this. week yeah, yeah. I, I came into this conversation knowing uh, this week I'd say seven people personally who got laid off. Wow. Uh, more if I think if I think about it, between the me the messenger shuts down, uh, burning through this money, trying to create, but the messenger 
is the kind of organization that if, if, if David Simon was writing about it or tweeting about it now, probably have had the same thought. Right about then, it would sound like a nightmare, which was, hey, we're mm-hmm. going to hire a bunch of journalists, but a lot of them are just going to be aggregating news they saw elsewhere into stories that will get traffic. You know, that was not a dream for anyone, but that didn't even work. Wow. Uh, you know, before before that, you mentioned you mentioned the journal, uh, the L.A. Times. That happened already. You even talked about that. But then and, and you're they're cutting people, including the L.A. Times. They got rid of the guy covering the Dodgers, which I think will be a, a be interesting <laughs> oh, beat man. the next year. Uh, so that all of the all the journalism horror conversations in the show in that meeting, yeah, they're they're surreal for that reason. But also even him discussing Chicago because at the time the Tribune right. company owned that. Yes. that's another good old days yeah. at this point because the, <laughs> yes. the sun just got bought uh by the guy who owns sinclair broadcasting the tribune isn't owned by the tribune anymore it's a hedge fund that just wants the real estate yes uh, yeah. like everything they talk about is about a thousand times worse than it yeah. was yeah. in this nightmare episode not yeah. only that like he's talking about uh you know the the the, the reactions of the people are the same because they've been at this paper for 20 years but in this episode like they're offering buyouts <laughs> whereas like if you read about what happened at the messenger they literally no they literally they no severance. They found out that they were getting laid off from a New York Times article, and then the editor in chief on Slack was like, "I'm I'm out of the loop on this." And then, like, <laughs> and then ten minutes later, they got locked out of the Slack itself, and uh, and the the entire website just turned into a blank white page that just says the Messenger, and all their work got deleted. Wow. There's a guy, according to Jordan Hoffman, who was the movie critic, was who was posting in the Slack about, hey, if we're losing our health insurance, I have the surgery booked, and, and they just cut him out and cut the Slack off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And by um, the way... Which is way more heartless than other layoffs I've heard about. Yeah, yeah. and by the way, Jordan Hoffman, uh, like, right when the messenger started was, like, a month or two after I got laid off from Uproxx, and he was like, hey, I just got hired at this place. I don't know what their deal is, but I know they're hiring a, a bunch of positions. You should, you should apply. I'll put in the good word. And I was like, oh, cool. And then I did for like jobs that I didn't really even want. And I got like rejected, like less than (laughs) rejection letters, like less than 48 hours later. Uh, And, uh, you know, I'd like to say that I feel good about not having work there, but I didn't even, it would have been nice to get the offer. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you you could have, you, it would have been not the first time that you had been immediately hired and then immediately fired for something. (laughs) Right. Yeah. No, (laughs) this is a, a, a pattern in the last few months, but yeah, like when you talked about like the Chicago sun, you know, the Chicago uh, tribune, um, like being the, parent company i guess Mm -hmm. uh it was like i remember a time where they were like buying up papers or or they were like the Mm -hmm. the parent company to all this and it is now all i hear about is like hedge funds coming into anything that you know can be described as doing journalism with print words um and just cutting all of the staff and turning the websites into big bloated ads for Heineken and then uh, and then deciding to sell it again and then over and over until everyone's gone. It's just like you just don't. Yeah. At, at this point, you, you, you there, yeah, there's there, no institutions left. Well, there <laughs> was a piece in the in the Atlantic that had some numbers and it was like in 2008, so when this episode aired, like the Denver area had 600 reporters between like the the few the handful of dailies in Denver and now there's 59, like so yeah. But I, crazy. I mean, I think um like you kind of need to go back because it, like David Simon is at least old enough to remember um, like what it looked like when they were doing it right. Like he's writing these characters, like the twig character, uh, you know, he can just rattle off like, right. uh, you know, Oh yeah. Daniels. He's uh he's married to this redhead who works in the state's attorney's <clears throat> office. He likes to give it to her sometimes. Uh, he, likes, he starts off a little fast <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. in the middle, he slows down a little bit. <laughs> like he knows everything. And like, you know, when you g- buy all those people out, like, of course the next, the next people down who have just gotten there are not going to have like that level of knowledge about any of the people that they're covering. I, I have that scene between Scott and uh twig. Tim worked on right away. Yeah, no problem. I'm all over it. What do you know about Daniels? Who is he? CID commander. Born in a couple of big wiretap cases. They gave him the Western, hoping to clean up that district after they shit can Bunny Colvin. Since getting separated, he's been shacked up with Ronnie Perlman over at the state's attorney's office. No suction early in his career, but now that he's got Carcetti's ear, now the brass stay out of his way. What's the man's favorite color? 
And while Mr. Deadwood here is working the story, see if you can feed him some React quotes. I love that too because of the fact that earlier, uh, when we find out Twig is getting let go, uh, Scott says, mm -hmm. you know, in passing, they just like uh, casually goes, uh, hopefully they're just getting rid of Deadwood. And, <laughs> um, and Gus clearly like internalized that and was like w ready to bust that out at him. I, I thought that was pretty fucking great. Um, There's another very quick shot. Uh, as soon as the meeting's over, the more with less meeting, mm -hmm. uh, Whiting puts his hands on a guy who looks kind of like Orville Redenbacher, like he's just yeah. like an old guy with <laughs> bottle glasses, and and they go, "Oh no!" And you just without any other storytelling, you're like, "Ah, oh, that's probably the columnist who'd been everywhere and covered World War II, and yeah. they're gonna send him off." Yeah, I love that too because they're like, "Oh no, you know, not Larry." <laughs> you just look at Larry <laughs> and you go, "Yeah, Larry's gotta go." Yeah, you gotta. Take them out back behind the barn. They're gonna shoot them. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, that institutional knowledge. I think you know, like the just uh, you. I know it's like obviously they're hitting you over the head with it in terms of theme, but like you do need people doing journalism who like know who the fuck runs the city you're in, and uh, and I think like the fact that people are not interested in that in like it should not be the reason why you don't have people who are paid to know that shit like someone is someone has got to be checking in that's that's why i've said this before but like every once in a while i hear about like some random la uh you know city you know elected official is like oh he's going to jail again and i'm just like oh man i really don't know what's going on in my own city <laughs> yeah like people are getting arrested and shit there's like corruption and like I just I just want to know what's going on with Taylor Swift and AI, you know? Yeah, yeah, th that's why the season's so resonant. I want to break it down, uh, but it, it, the whole... These guys, and then it happens later in the season that uh, the mayor starts exploiting this and pays no consequences, but it really is just everybody realizes they're, they're, all their business models don't work, and so they invest in, like, Vagrant Coin. Like they yeah. this new like, yeah. this new this new fake thing that they have to inflate and blow up. Yeah, uh, they're all going to benefit from it, and then uh, well, somebody's going to get hurt, but not us. Right, like, they're all in this part of the same scam because the only way to get people to pay attention is by scamming them, uh, and, and then having them not know it. That's a that's a really perfect point. Vagrant coin like is yeah. what they end up doing. Uh, McNulty starts minting it, uh, and it's the only way that he can he can get some. The faucet open is to <laughs> sell some of that uh, dead homeless crypto. Yeah, that is, I think that's a, a perfect way of putting it. Um, but, oh, is that our producer, Brent Flyberg? It's me, and uh, I think we have some uh, dead homeless crypto to sell. So I think oh. we need to take a break for ads. Okay, <laughs> you heard the man. It is time for us to take a quick break to sell you on uh, some NFTs of uh, post-mortem choked out homeless dudes. Um, <laughs> you can get that uh, wherever you get your crypto, but stick around. We'll be right back. And we're back. Okay. So we were talking about what was going on in the Sun Papers. Um, there's kind of um, uh, a cross between a few different uh, storylines and the Sun Papers in this episode. Uh, you've got them being utilized by multiple uh, different facets of, you know, people in the wire. So you've got Jimmy McNulty trying to use them uh, uh, in order to sell his homeless guy story. Um, you see Alma at the beginning of this episode, um, like running to the, you know, newspaper printing factory, uh, trying to get a copy of her, you know, of her story uh, before it comes out. And then she's mad because it's below the fold and it's not many inches. Is that a, is that well, a it's thing? It's not on the front page either. It is. It's not on the front page. They moved to the, the Metro section right. and, and below the fold. Yeah. Yeah. And so below the fold is even, even worse, right? Yeah, the the best placement you get is a one like it's the thing again. You're imagining uh, a news box or something at a at a convenience store which doesn't exist anymore. Right. But the thing that your eye catches it's it's what are the most important things in the world? Yeah. There's a picture of this war happening. There's this murder that happened. There's this guy running. Oh, and if you don't make that, 
um, you're you're maybe the reader's never going to see you, and now the reader's not going to see anything. But that's why yeah. that's why that still matters. I mean, I, I when I was at the post, still, I mean, even as people were not picking up the print paper like they used to, getting a one above the fold meant that is the most important thing happening today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then well, you know, having like first page of the or like top billing on the website or whatever. That'd be like yeah, or on TV, like our yeah. lead story tonight. Yeah, right. Or like uh, having most upvoted post on Reddit. <laughs> for those of you who go to <laughs> go to Reddit, um, yeah, being no. retweeted the most by Mr. Musk. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you get the most amount of reposts on X. That was another fun story <laughs> this week where he just like tweeted. He just tweets that, oh yeah, we did the first uh, Neuralink. Uh, it went well, and everybody's like, does anybody uh, anybody know who this guy is? Does anybody can anybody <laughs> actually check that that actually happened? And everybody's like, I don't know, man. Yeah, he no. said Who, it. Whose job is it to check? No <laughs> one's. I it's, think. I think it was literally, just Popular Science that wrote a story saying it's interesting that he didn't prove this at all or <laughs> explain if the guy's alive. But, yeah, but yeah, a lot of people said, "Wait, Elon Musk equals clicks." Therefore, I will take this tweet and put it in my CMS and publish it. There we go. That's news. Oh my god, things are only gonna get worse. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like learning to uh, play or game the algorithm seems to be um, McNulty's like um, storyline in this episode. He is uh, he's decided it's not enough to just, you know, tell his, you know, bosses about a serial killer. He needs to kind of like embellish a little bit. So he creates one um, by staying up all night. Uh, drinking his ass off um, and uh, writing a red ribbon into old case files, including one old case file by Ray Cole, who is a dead detective <laughs> um, on the show. Um, I think it was played by Robert Colesbury, the yeah, one of the show's died, producers, died in real life. Yeah, who died in real life, and he uh, he goes in and he and he amends his case file to add the red ribbon, and he's like explaining this to Bunk, who is. <laughs> Um, I mean, Wendell Pierce does such a good job of being everyone who's watching this season, uh, you know, being like uh, the guy who's like, what is wrong with you? This is a fucking insane idea. You should not be doing this. And uh, I have a, a clip of this. Cool. When this fucking unit is going to catch me? Most of the guys up here come catch the clap in a Mexican whorehouse. What's with the red ribbon? Barlow had a open strangle years back. Homeless guy with a red ribbon tied around his wrist. So that's two. Also, I found an open homeless case, which Ray Cole worked. I wrote a ribbon into his office reports. So there's three. Our guy didn't have a red ribbon. That's where I'm headed. Jesus. Listen to yourself. <laughs> Upstairs wouldn't jump on a real serial killer. Fucking Marlowe. Well, maybe they need the make-believe. Yeah. <laughs> he fuck you? He tried. Mostly he just fucks himself. Mm. It's beautiful. I love that he's also just openly slugging booze in front of him as he tells him his scheme. <laughs> yeah. I also like the look on Wendell Pierce's face when uh, McNulty tries to give him some of the booze and he's kind of like, it's like, no, but you can tell in his heart like, he kind of wants it. Yeah, I was but... like, listen, I'd like to get a little drunk, but at this point, I just don't want to encourage you. Yeah, which yeah, seems, yeah. seems to be where Bunk is at throughout this episode and kind of throughout the whole uh, season. There's also see. a great line in there where he's like, hey, man, we're not young anymore. Like if I, I just bought patio furniture, yeah. like I can't, <laughs> yeah. I can't lose this job. Yeah. The cold open of this episode, or maybe it's not even, it's like, there's like three or four different scenes in the box uh, with uh, Jimmy and Bunk. Um, and like one of them, he is literally going through uh, just every single possible excuse to not do this. And all of them are super valid. It's stuff like, <laughs> this is not going to work. You're going to go to jail. You have a wife, you have kids, you have an ex-wife, uh, you have mortgage payments. We just bought patio furniture. Like he just keeps going and going. And, uh, it is like every, uh, the response to, from Jimmy every time is, I, I but I'm smarter than everyone. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, it's going to work because I will will it into existence, which, um, you know, we'll, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, uh, so Jimmy ends up uh, doing this stuff with uh, Barlow, who's a detective, trying to convince him to not convince him. He's trying to get him to remember 
that yeah. he had a case in which there was a red ribbon tied around a dead vagrant's wrist and he spends multiple scenes trying to get him to pay attention to it it is one of my favorite sequences uh and i i have uh, a clip of that as well he's homeless but he had a red ribbon tied around his wrist <laughs> i mean what does a homeless guy have to remember that he should have a red ribbon tied around his wrist <laughs> Bolo. What? Nice out. Oh, like Chanel number five comes out of your ass, Morland. <laughs> five minutes later. Look at this. Red ribbon in one of Ray Cole's files. Hey, hon. How's the stain look on the cabinets? They dry yet? <laughs> Two thousand years later. What kind of knot you say was on that? Red ribbon. Fuck yourself with your red ribbon. Just thought of something. I caught a vagrant months back, had a red ribbon tied around his wrist. You remember that? <laughs> Hell of a catch, detective. Hell of a catch. <laughs> He's such... Look at that fucking look on his face. He's just like a proud little boy who just blew up a frog. <laughs> he, is so, he is so pleased with himself. Uh, and, but I like the way yeah. this goes where the whole time you're like, man... You're going to get caught if you keep just like talking about this so loud in the middle of the, the police department. Someone's right. going to catch you. And then, and then uh, you know, he picks up the phone and he's talking about cabinet stains. And you're like, oh, yeah, these guys <laughs> yeah, no don't give a shit. <laughs> like they got their own things going on. They're not like, paying attention to you. They can't catch uh, criminals who are like who they are paid to catch. Like, let alone even pay attention at the crimes happening right next to them in the desk across the way. Like, there's just, there's no, no one's going to catch. And I think that's my favorite thing that Jimmy says is, who's going to catch me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and even Bunk's like, uh, good point, but I might tell on you. Um, and we, yeah. we get that the paper, too, with uh, with Alma being told, like, oh, the reason no one cares is it's the wrong zip code. Like, for, right. not for vagrant killings, just any crime that is not white people uh, who have, like, a pretty story to tell on Nancy Grace. Yes. Like, that, we're not, no one will care. Don't worry about it. It's yeah. a different episode, I think, where, where Templeton calls it, like, a shit news town. But that's yeah. what he means, is, like, all the yeah. crime here is for people that don't matter. <laughs> Black. Yes. That's yeah. what they're saying. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Like, that is exactly right. And, and, uh, uh, it is uh it's interesting i i didn't actually put that together when i saw that in the previous episode where he goes ah it's a shit news town and i'm you're you're 100 percent right it's because no one cares because uh, it's a mostly black town and no one cares about crime if it's happening in that in that zip code um that is 100 percent true and it's uh you you see both jimmy and alma finally like meeting up when Jimmy goes up to Jay and is like, hey, I have this, you know, serial killer. And Jay just does that jack off motion. Um, and uh, really what? lurid jack off motion. Like he so he makes several runs at it in case he get, he get, he's miss, <laughs> he's, yeah, he case, missed what he's doing. In case you missed it, he, he like not only does it like it. He, his dick farts come in <laughs> in the jack off motion, which I've never seen that before. But I, I like it. Um, I'm, but, I'm interested in the other storyline mm -hmm. where, uh, what's Reggie Cavey's, uh, character's name again? Um, uh, who, uh, uh, uh Carcetti's, uh, oh, advisor. Norman. Norman, Norman. Yeah. Yes. When oh, yeah. Norman goes to Gus and they're old friends and, uh, it's a, like, he's feeding him a story that is clearly not really it's it's more of a like tentative story like well, he's feeding a, him he's right. feeding him uh a hypothetical um but he knows but like, the, it's still good for him to source. cover right yeah. yeah i mean i think it's uh you know i think it's a, a an anonymous source right but it's uh he is trying to feed him this story about um the possibility of burrell being out because burrell um like cooked the stats um which is something that uh i mean clearly carchetti has been asking people to do but not saying to do like carchetti has been this whole season so far has been yelling at burrell and people about like don't bring me fake stats but then being like get the crime down and everyone's yeah. like there's no way to do that without <laughs> cooking the stats um and uh so like 
they finally kind of have some sort of excuse to get rid of him uh, with the like cooking of the books and uh, and they want to replace him with Daniels and they want to see if the ministers and I guess like the important the, the movers and structure. shakers yeah can live with that and so Norman brings the story to uh, to Gus I guess I'm just interested in the idea of when uh, reporters like they know they're being used but it's still they still have to cover it because it's like it's still news because because it's news yeah, yeah. it's an interesting th- uh, thing politically like Dave you were in that like political mm-hmm. journalism world uh like how much of that scene with uh Norman and Gus is something that like you've seen before or like you know where you people are there's sort of this like symbiotic relationship between you know keeping access with your sources and then still doing real news but kind of doing news that you know is like has a ulterior motive i don't know how much did you relate relate to that scene yeah you don't pass along stuff that's just fully fake but you'll get pretty for one i mean there is a lot of sourcing that happens when you're off the clock and you're at a bar or you're having dinner you ever you're at a restaurant right uh that, that's part of the point that's when we ever were trying to buck ourselves up and think hey i can't replace this it's still robots cannot be friends with people and and t- check with them off the record like that that's sure. still not not possible so that that's real that's real you get stuff that is being sold to you uh um the, the things are put, the best faces put on it and sometimes you have enough sources that can tell you why it's why it's wrong if something seems fishy though you, you should have a big enough roll decks big enough notebook to check with people and have people saying all right this doesn't make any sense for x reasons x and y and z uh, right. In my reporting, it's, it's mostly been politics. It's been, I mean, this happened in the presidential campaign. The DeSantis campaign was clearly falling apart for four months or so yeah. and would try to and put out numbers that, uh, uh, metrics and numbers that they, that you could write, you could write, that's what they said, but then you could go for yourself and see, was their campaign office open? Have they cut ad buys? You have to right. just check things from a bunch of different angles. Uh, so yeah, but you get, you get like opportunistically uh, lied to pretty f- frequently. And you, right. you just, you fall for it if you suck, which is the Scott Templeton story. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. D- 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 There's d- also d- like that level yeah. of, uh, you have to quote a source near to something, even though right. it, like it could just be like that person telling you, but saying you can't use my name or whatever. Yeah, that was the part that really st- stuck with me the most in the Templeton scenes this time was uh, him lifting his phone up Constantly, he's a little. It's a little cartoony. He's like he looks looks yeah. around like he's he's like a cartoon wolf uh, yeah. for a second, yeah. and then and then puts puts down the phone, makes up a juicy quote uh, that he lies to his editor about the source of because there is no source, and it, it winds up in in Daniels's hand. But he writes it in everybody's hands. It's in the paper. Right. Daniels reacts to it. He he things start shifting because he made that quote up. And this is one of my. I'm I'm like. There's a point for using anonymous anonymous quotes. It's usually to say, "All right, we know this is true, and this person is telling us it's true, but we're not going to use their name." And the shift to it, well, this story would be a lot better if somebody had honestly just dunked dunked on this guy. Right. Uh, yeah. That has been one of the trends of my life. It's not normally made up. It's just you know you can. There are people that you can call if you're on deadline. You're cranking something out. Who's going to say, "Hey." you know, uh, if permission to speak freely with anonymity. Does this guy suck? Oh yeah, he sucks. Uh, here's a juicy reference to, you know, a, a movie from the thirties oh. or something. That's funny. Uh, like you call it dial a quote basically. And oh. I try, obviously I'm talking about it cause I don't do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. If you read an article, you can recognize like, why is this guy anonymous? Just like, why are we giving this guy, why is this person have anonym- uh, anonymity to say Trump is angry or that's, right. that's yeah. a very, that's a very popular one. Trump is raging in Mar-a-Lago said one close <laughs> one. Yeah. I saw one, the other day that was um like quoting Repub- like people with knowledge of what the trump campaign is is thinking like you don't even have the trump campaign you just have somebody with knowledge of it that could yeah. be anybody <laughs> right and that's that's your dialogue quote like what if the temple does is making it up he could just as easily could have called like some sort he don't have him i guess some democratic source who doesn't know anything right. and say what do you think of this and then said one de- one plugged in source n- near city hall said X. right Right. And I like that he I like that Scotty Templeton is a little more savvy about it. Like he knows like he knows better than McNulty that he really has to juice the fuck out of this uh, in order mm-hmm. for anyone to pay attention. And then 
the reaction of Gus is great because like to Gus, like Gus is in the know, like clear, like immediately the quote doesn't like pass the smell test for him because he's yes. like, you know, this quote is just too perfect. But yeah. uh, like Templeton's going to do it anyway because he knows that because he uh, got taken off the story by fucking twig because yeah. he didn't have the knowledge no. to write the story but he wants to prove that he's got game and yeah. i i have that entire scene uh-huh um i'm gonna do evil <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. come here carcetti may be holding the knife but daniel's sharp in it for him he's been critical of burrell since the election baba booey baba booey who wrote this <laughs> yeah. good shit huh you feel comfortable telling me where you got that? Not really. It being a source. Well, it's a great quote, but uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna slam somebody anonymously, I at least have to be sure that the quote comes from Reese Campbell. You got any reason to say that, huh? Twig's not the only guy with game around here. God, he sucks so much. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like literally, Such a fucking weasel. I love it. You, you, like looking at fucking. Uh, the way Scott operates in that whole uh, scene, it's it's no wonder Gus's radar is up immediately with this thing. Cause he's like, number one, the quote is too perfect. Number two, he, he ends it by like literally referencing a, a tiff that they had earlier in the day where he's like, see, I'm good at this too. And it's like, mm, yeah, I think you're <laughs> yeah. lying to me. Um, so like Scott, kind of doesn't have any game at lying, but at the same time, he sure does get rewarded for it a lot. Um, but I wanted to ask Dave, so like when you get, uh, um, I imagine it's like you get pitches for, or, or, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like we do with like podcast guests, we have like some publicists reaching out and giving us like all this, like, uh, information um that they want us to yeah but what's less like that it's more like pr people their pr manager of some you know campaign will reach out to you and tell you what story to write i imagine that is something uh that happens and do you do you ever see like people uh like your colleagues or whatnot um who just <clears throat> reprint exactly what the the essentially the propaganda is from like whatever <laughs> political candidate and not that direct i'll get i've gotten pitches where i pass on it and i see the story somewhere else two days later with the angle they were going for right if, if it's really if it's really bad reporting all they did all, the only people they quoted were the the initial uh like the people <laughs> who pitched them it just it's yeah. just i've seen that happen a couple times uh but i've i there's been that kind of story where somebody pitches me and i say well this is interesting i wouldn't have seen it had you not pitched me sure uh, let's talk let's vet it i mean i once kind of, kind of got annoyed with somebody who who came it came with me through um, a pr person and i wrote the story but the story had extra stuff in it right. just explain it get context here's the angle and the the person not the publicist who felt bad about the, this but the guy who the story was about called me complaining about it and i and i said in like one of my very few hard ass you know gus moments is like i think what the, what you were looking for is a press release and you can make that yourself and oh, i just yeah. hung up on yeah. him yeah yes uh, but that, will, that does yeah. happen. And, and I think that the you like as we all get terrified of being laid off uh, or the industry collapsing, uh, l l one effect is I feel like people know they can't be lazy. So I see that happen a little bit less than I used to. I will yeah. say like I have an acquaintance uh, in in journalism and they seem like they have the most stable uh job <laughs> of any like journalist I know. And like their whole like all they do is uh basically get press releases from like tech companies and just write down like exactly whatever the whatever like the tech PR blast wants to be like they just write it down and put oh, it out rules. and then other tech people come to them and and give them give more of the same uh like bullshit press releases and like no vetting goes on like no Hell analysis yeah. it's just straight up like Get so and back. so so and so from quibble quibbly dibbly uh yeah. says that their valuation is x amount and then right yeah it's, they have over it's 60 trillion active users <laughs> yeah and yeah. yeah it's crazy but uh that's it's yeah. a cool job, man. I mm -hmm. want a job. That's where half I... the Elon reporting. That changed recently, right. but so much the Elon reporting is that Elon claims this, and you can find. I mean, 
fingers speaking of baltimore one of the funniest elon stories is back when he was going around selling hyperloop like lyle landley to all these cities yeah uh, and you can go back and find him meeting with the governor of maryland about how they were going to do it in baltimore larry hogan not the new one uh and reporting at the time that was hey elon said this will it work we didn't ask anyone if it'll work yeah, <laughs> but like, yeah, years yeah. later there's good reporting on how it was all bs but yeah but yeah that's pretty easy to snow pe- snow politicians and media should be better than that but it isn't always yeah yeah i mean and this uh this episode i mean i mean this whole season is about how um yeah media should be better than that and the reasons why it's not and the reasons why it's not is because uh we love us some salaciousness you know we uh we want shit to get weird, and that's that's why I love the um, where the McNulty story goes. Uh, you know, when he's first trying to get it in the paper. By the way, a scene that I I love real quick: uh, Alma and Jimmy together. Uh, Jimmy's pitching the story, <laughs> and <laughs> Jimmy. You're gonna run something, something right away, right? Gotta get the word out on this. What kind of name is Alma? I have a boyfriend, detective. Yeah? He bigger than me? <laughs> Just like... <laughs> he's not even trying with that pickup line. What kind of name is it? <laughs> it's just... That is, like, so... Like, that is such low-effort horniness, you know? Where I like how it starts geez, with that's him. That's one degree above... Uh, so are you, like, uh, Mexican or <laughs> Chinese? <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, I like that's how it, scheme brain. Like he's already <laughs> flirting with people. But when you're like, think you're getting a scheme over on people, you get way more confident. I'm told yes. I've never done this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like how he uh, he started that by like complimenting her work and how oh, you're you're really good at this. Like your articles, oh, so great. And she's like, what the fuck are you talking yeah, about? You haven't you. read anything. That I, There's no I way you like, read. Yeah. And I feel like that's how like pitches start, where you're like not sure. How much to uh, take people seriously when they say that they're, uh, you know, they yeah. start by complimenting the things that you've written? Yeah. Yeah. If I any mean, PR person listens to this podcast, uh, it's easy to not do that. Like, really just read one of the, the, click on the guy's byline and read one of the articles and then refer to that. Because the one way we, well, there are many ways we'll, like, never re- take your pitch. But, but yeah. every reporter has stories of... Hi, name of reporter. I noticed that you've been cover you've been covering NFTs a lot, and I work for and like, don't cover yeah. that. Not my name. Yeah. Never gonna talk to you. Bye. Yeah. I mean, oh, I man. I can only imagine that like at this point, the the one job that AI is gonna have the biggest trouble replacing is uh like those publicist uh pitch emails, you know, because of the fact that they're so obvious uh and so. All I can think, because I think, you know, when I see something, because we see that all the time, at least on the fraudcast, like uh, email address where uh, we get, you know, hey, fraud, I've been listening to, <laughs> and it's like, uh, you know, uh, our name is not fraud, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, uh, I don't know, I mean, maybe like PR people are going to be the only human jobs left, and they're just going to be doing PR for the machine, like they're going to make the machine sound more human fuck whoa <laughs> holy shit guys that's a crazy world i just oh so in my crazy head. oh yeah um but yes uh finally uh jimmy uh realizes what he needs to do and this happens because he meets with the uh, freeman in the box with bunk and that is just to me one of my favorite scenes so i'm going to play that one as well because freeman fucking rules fucked up yeah tell him you know, I mean, if you want to do it right, a straight up strangle's not enough. <laughs> Sensationalize it. <laughs> Give the killer some fucked up fantasy, something bad, real bad. It's got to grip the hearts and minds. Give the people what they want from a serial killer. What the fuck? No, you're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> Who gives a damn if we fake a couple of murders that we're never going to solve, huh? The dead men don't care. No one cares. But if it's going to get the bosses to throw down enough coin to do police work... I'm out. I'm out of here. we got to give your killer a name. We have to kill again. I mean, that is... <laughs> that's fucking incredible. 
I would just like to take a minute to praise the composition on that because oh, they're yeah. shooting that scene in a gray <laughs> interrogation room about the most boring of a uh, backdrop that you can have for a scene. But yeah. just like the subtle way that, you know, they, sh- they, they have uh, Freeman at an angle and Bunk yes. sort of like comes along in the background and stares at him while he's telling the story. Like, oh, just an excellent shot right there. It's It's beautiful to look at. And also it is like I can already see people watching that scene and fucking hating it because of, again, the like character shift in Freeman where they're just like, what Freeman wouldn't do that, you know? And, and uh, I don't know, man, like I watch that scene now with so much excitement because I'm like, I love this. I love yeah. that. They're just like, fuck it. Freeman's going to go along with it. He's, he's like, hell yeah. I love it. Great idea, bro. Let's, 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 let's go for it. Uh, it is. Yes. It's TV. Yes. It's like, you know, the, a more sensationalized, uh, arc for the wire, but I feel like it's realistic enough that it it makes sense. Like I go with it. Um, yeah. I also, so I was been reading, um, some of the, uh, the oral history on the wire and, uh, there's like a, there's a nugget about how Clark Peters, um, the guy who plays, uh, Lester. Yeah. He like early on in the show's run, he bought like a five bedroom house in, uh, Baltimore and he just had it as like his bohemian like crash pad for like him and like Reggie Cathy and a few, few of the other people (laughs) there. And they would like talked about how they would like paint and like play saxophone and, and listen just to like jazz <laughs> just like do <laughs> cool old guy actor shit with each other yeah. and it sounded so awesome <laughs> yeah very um uh like dudes rock old head edition yes you know yeah. like they were the, the, just like it was the jazz house because like apparently you know a lot of the um uh, other actors, you know, uh, lived together in these kind of like bungalow apartments and stuff like that. And they had kind of more, you know, uh, like McNulty lifestyle uh, houses um, or like rentals that they had while they were filming. But not Lester. Lester was yeah. like, no, no I'm was... even more like this in real life. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it was uh, it was Herc and Carve were yes. like had a, had the apartment where everybody just like played Madden. And right. Like, it was the disgusting other. brothers apartment for. <laughs> Yeah. Herc and Carve. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, uh, Lesser Freeman is like fucking playing saxophone and smoking. Yeah. Yeah. The jazz and castle and doing paintings. Yeah. Fucking badass. And I just, I love, I love Freeman's like, like turn there where he just is like going with it. And, yeah. um, especially well, you can't resist. Yeah. He's like, he is low key McNulty. That's been his right. role in the whole show is that he can't resist like a little puzzle or like a little, yeah. uh, a mind game. And he, his mind game is like, okay, how do we trick them into paying attention? That's a great yeah. idea. I love this mind game. He's a less emotional, more strategic McNulty. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in terms of uh, the rest of the storylines that uh, happen in the episode, I mean, we have uh, the grand jury's going on, and Clay Davis is uh, on trial for his life. He is going around. He's trying to, um, you know, he's trying to convince the mayor to get him uh, to, you know, drop the thing, if drop drop the charges, if uh, and I'll help you get Daniels through. But he doesn't need that help because the news story came out. No one was complaining about Daniels. Yeah. Possibly no one cared. Being commissioner. Yeah. No one gives a shit. Um, and then, uh, you've got Marlo who is, um, trying to, uh, Marlo is, is trying to basically supersede prop Joe, uh, with the Greeks yeah, trying and to I- cut him out of the connect. So there was a couple things in this episode that I, uh, like a little bit of, uh, contradictions that I yes. feel compelled to point out. And Please. one is Marlo. Uh, you know, he gets, he's got the hot tip about the Greek. So he goes into that little diner to, to find him. And the first thing that happens is the guy at the counter, he turns the music up real loud, like in case there's a, a wire and anyone's Someone listening. listening yeah, right. <laughs> right. And then like two scenes later, he comes back and he just has like a full sit down with Vondis at a table, like three feet away from the, the uh, bar at the, at the diner in the same diner. Right. <laughs> and I was like, ah, I don't know about that. Yeah, I mean, th- there was that for me uh, where I was confused is <clears throat> when so Vondis tells uh, Marlo that his money is dirty um, and not as in needs to be laundered through some sort of front, but like physically, literally dirty, like smelly, smelly money. 
Um, and then he goes to prop Joe Marlowe does. And is like, I need someone to clean my money, um, physically. And prop Joe's like, Oh yeah, you know, I can, uh, I can do that. But he's not at all suspicious of like, does prop Joe know he's doing that for the Greeks? I don't uh, think he, I don't think he and does. also, but how wouldn't he like, how often is, you know, like who else does prop Joe know who is like finicky about the, smell the smelliness of money you know what i mean it seems like it seems know, like kind of cheese obvious. is slowly picking up on it or something is the yeah felt like what they were trying to do there but i don't know yeah maybe so i was confused by it but uh the other you know. so yeah so the other the other thing that i thought was funny is twig uh, apparently doesn't know what the word to mess it means but he later in the episode <laughs> yeah. i mean fully capable of breaking down daniel's his entire resume and just knows uh hl making quotes like by heart yeah off the top of his head yeah off uh, the dome. and it's you know, he's he's reading them like a poet, and he's like, "I'm just a crime beat reporter. What do I, what do I know?" But then again, I didn't know what tumescent meant until I saw this episode. So who the fuck knows? Mm. Not everyone knows everything, Vince. Yeah, I guess other people have not done copywriting for the porn industry, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you telling me if i search two messin on x videos i'll find possibly a vince manzini uh like copy are i feel like i knew that word before but i mean maybe i'm just overlooking uh things in my background that would explain why i would know it's why, probably what, yeah. yeah it was probably because you did copywriting for for porn captions um but uh, yeah, so Marlo then also uh, learns how to put his money his money's overseas, and you know he goes and sees that his money is there. That doesn't matter. I was, I was yeah. sort of disappointed because so Marlo Marlo goes to uh, the Antilles uh, to, to see his money. He has like this cute interaction with the French, the, the hot French bank teller, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. who as we all know, exists in the Antilles. Uh, and then there's like a smash cut to a guy on a jet ski. Um, and I, I was really hoping that the guy on the jet ski would be Marlo. Like the idea of Marlo, just like <laughs> riding a jet ski around the, yeah. the Caribbean was really uh, pleasing to me, but it turns out it's actually Omar. So I was a little, I was a little disappointed when the, the jet ski yeah. person did not turn out to be Marlo because I just had a mental picture of Marlo on a jet ski and it made me happy. Yeah, they do a good job of making Marlo um like provincial enough that if that he had actually been on a jet ski, I would have been like, mm, It's no. a good no, I think like it's a he, great he is, juxtaposition. He's, he's clearly never left Baltimore. Like that right. his character is very much yeah. not someone who has like left but he's never been to the antilles yeah uh, well it's yeah, yeah. he and has I, like zero interest like we've never yes. seen him enjoying anything except like shoplifting and killing a cop killing the security guard <laughs> yeah but, right but that's, that's, like, see, that's his favorite shit yeah, but exactly. you can see yeah. him riding a jet ski for the first time and enjoying it and being like oh shit what have i been i've been missing this my entire life it's like that yeah. uh um what's his name uh it, i forget that com the comedian's name but he has the bit about cholos in nature uh yeah. Oh, who does that bit? Is it? No, I don't know who does Madrigal. it. Madrigal. Al Madrigal. Madrigal. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, more importantly, uh, what happens with Marlo is that he is decided he's back on the hunt for uh, Omar. And in order to get Omar, they, um, they find someone close to him. And Cheese gives up Butchie. Um, and then... In that scene, here actually, I I have that scene just because it was the first time I realized that Cheese has a um, what do you call it? Uh, catchphrase. Oh yeah. yeah. I burnt, giving away fifty for a line of Omar's people. His sister, his me ma, some faggy be with, all that shit count. You hear me? I let sleeping dogs lie, son. Uh, I know you would, Joe. I mean, you smart like that. Me? Blind motherfucker. Don't know about Butchie. Motherfucker, I know about it. Know where my cheese at, man. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> <laughs> Where are my cheese? At? I mean, is that is that his <laughs> is that his catchphrase? This All whole the time? East guys, East Side guys, have really on the nose. Uh, really days. on the nose. Prop <laughs> Joe, I got a proposition for you. Cheese. Where are my cheese at? I mean, let's. 
Come on, yeah. come on, man. Um, I, I will. I have to praise the re- restraint of the wires directors and writers because, like, as a viewer, every time Snoop opens her mouth, uh, like pure gold comes out, yes, and yes. Z- like the the fact that she only gets like a few lines in any given episode it speaks to their restraint because goddamn like i would have i would have given her like 20 minutes of screen time in, in every episode as soon as uh you know as soon as as soon as she had that nail gun scene in the in the yeah. last season i was like oh well, clearly this person's gold we got to go with this i i think like had i mean we'll see what happens with snoop's character but i will say i there's part of me that wishes like an alternate universe in which there is a snoop spinoff mm-hmm. um and it could be like animated it could be like peanuts <laughs> uh-huh. you just replace snoopy with snoop um <laughs> and they're like trying to get charlie brown's christmas tree and shit and um but like Felicia Pearson's there for some reason. And Chris is kind of like Woodstock because they both, you know. Yeah, they chill. They're, 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 yeah, they're I like that. They're scruffy outsiders. The scruffies. Kind of sociopaths. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then finally, uh, Michael is goes to Six Flags, and uh, that is just um, that's just uh, it's nice to see him uh, be a kid again. Um, because shit has gotten uh very very real, and I just have a little clip of that. Everything's so serious now. What? What, nigga? <laughs> Six flags be open again. <laughs> Look at them having a time of their lives. They meet some girls. Oh, boy. You know, I really <laughs> fucking hated those commercials. I'm um, just glad Dominic Chini's got some money off, you know, for something other than The Sopranos. <laughs> yeah, Uncle Junior really, you know, I, I, he was like, listen, I'm making some of the money off Sopranos, but really where it's at are these Six Flags Dancing Guy commercials. That's where the money is. Um, it's, it's sad that party music really peaked with the Venga Boys and no one has ever come close since. It's a shame. Yeah, yeah, it is too bad. It is too bad. The, you know, if you're out there and you're thinking of a, putting together some sort of party rock dance music squad, <laughs> um, we encourage it because mm-hmm. who's left? Um, yeah, and that is the episode. Uh, favorite scene, least favorite scene, something I missed, Vince? Uh, one thing that we did not talk about, uh, like we, we gave short shrift to the, the brief Omar storyline. And yeah. uh, speaking of like people having like on the nose, like trademarks and catchphrase, I feel like this is the third time I believe that Omar can't find honey nut Cheerios. I don't know what it is with this guy. Like they're hiding the honey nut Cheerios from him <laughs> at all times. Like, it can- like I've never had this much trouble finding honey nut Cheerios. Oh shit. But- Omar coming. You just put the box behind <laughs> regular Cheerios. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, they just, uh, again, a little bit, they like to hammer home the, uh, you know, the weird um, yeah. eccentricities. They're and- like, you know, this guy that uh, carries around, uh, that that rolls around the hood in a duster with a shotgun and a bulletproof vest and always and whistles, whistling, whistles yeah. the same song. Not enough trademarks. We got to also have yeah, a yeah. thing where he yeah, likes he Honey Nut Cheerios. he also likes Honey Nut. <laughs> <laughs> just someone in the room. <laughs> The writers room, like, make sure you add the honey nut thing. I think yeah, that's I came up with that. That was my thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Dave, uh, anything we missed? Anything uh, is that sticks out as your favorite? Anything that sticks out as the worst? Uh, the the fav- favorite scene, I think, really is at the is at the end. You already were talking about it, where where to Bunk's dismay, uh, his 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 best friends are going to do a do a scheme. Uh, that yeah. undermines their ever all their life's work. That was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I, I think, yeah, that, that was my favorite scene because I keep going. I, uh, it, this is overall, like, I, I think a, almost, almost a laugh per, per sequence, right? Either, yeah. either something yeah. funny a character says or something stupid happening, or even the sight. I know it's, it's meant to sig- I know what it's meant to signify, but just the, any sight of Omar having fun, uh, which we, we, we just discussed really funny, uh, doesn't mm-hmm. happen that many other times in the series. So, uh, but re- just the the glee with which uh, with McNulty says we need to kill again. Uh, that's that's my takeaway from this episode. I love that. 
Yeah, it is. Yeah, that, they they draw a strong contrast between Marlo and Omar, which is that uh, like the basic difference between them is Omar is capable of enjoying himself in the Caribbean, whereas uh, Marlo not. Yeah, you know, he he just wants to see and hold his money, and he's not even that charmed by the super beautiful French speaking uh bank teller what does uh, that bank teller tell you when you ask that by the way is there any chance the bank teller is just like yeah that's not really how this works like we have money it's not like there's a special cubby hole for your money right yeah <laughs> we don't have a special box w- with all of your money in it in fact we are only liquid about like a percentage of your money <laughs> yeah, yeah there's no hole out back with a pine cone on it that has a, yeah i can't imagine a sign going on it that all says the way there money. actually helped him like alleviate his concern that yeah. his money was just now gone <laughs> did this help you conceptualize banks better i hope right, so yeah yeah what what did he learn from this um doesn't matter he seems to trust it that's all that matters um yeah if i had to give this episode a letter grade and i do it's a lot i would give it i'll give it a b plus vince what would you give this mm-hmm. it's all b plus what okay dave <laughs> uh what would you give this episode if you had to give it a letter grade uh, I mean, on, on like a scale of one to a hundred, I'd put it like ninety-one percent. Uh, okay, so that, that's a B plus. That's a B plus yeah. on most conventional grading systems. Yeah. Yeah, it was called you know a minus B plus. If we average it all out, that's a B plus episode of The Wire. And you know what, guys? That's an A plus 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 episode of Pod Yourself The Wire. Dave, thank you so much for coming on this podcast again and talking about The Wire with us. No, it was yeah. awesome. I felt good about journalism for like 75 minutes. Which Hell yeah. It hasn't happened in a while. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. No, that's if there's one thing you can take away from this show, it's it'll make you feel good about journalism. <laughs> uh, where can people find your work? Uh, where can people find you online? Yeah, you can find the the stuff I, I paid to write uh, at Semaphore. Uh, good stuff every every few days there. I write a newsletter called Americana that you can sc- subscribe to for free. Uh, it, it's going well, which is it just feels weird right now. You get a lot of survivor's mm-hmm. guilt in the media if you're, yeah. if you're if you're if you're doing okay. <laughs> and then I still post. I post my every, every all my stuff online is my name. So Twitter a little bit less than you know two years ago I'd say that. But at Dave sure. Weigel, Blue Sky, Dave Weigel, uh, that's kind of it. Uh, I'm yeah. on TV sometimes. Uh, if you're into that, if you subs- yeah. if you're a cable subscriber, which everybody is, uh, watch me on <laughs> CNN next week. Hell yeah. Check him out on CNN. Uh, and You just got uh, all the other journalists walking around being like, so, uh, oh, Semaphore, uh, who, who books that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, <laughs> how'd you get that? Um, but yes, uh, follow him. Uh, subscribe to the newsletter. Read the stuff he does on Semaphore. Uh, Dave Weigel, once again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Hell yeah. Wire. Patreon.com slash Frotcast. The $8 tier gets you a shout out and a street name. Vince, we have one, two, three, four, five, six names today. Mm. And the first two, mm. I'm going to be honest, the first two happened um, when uh, Bad Has Barra started. Um, so I don't know if they actually know they're getting a shout out. But because they, they paid so much money, I feel like I have to. So sir, first we're starting with Steve Gehring, $50. Now, well, I don't know anybody else whose last name no, is Gehring. That, no, I don't that'll think, be a hard nickname to come up with. I don't know if there's... Listen, I'm not saying that everyone with the last name Gehring doesn't like Israelites, but I, I would assume... <laughs> <laughs> that this is probably no relation to the bad Gehring. This is yeah. a more conscientious pro-Palestinian Gehring. But go on. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to call this guy Scuba Steve because I don't, you know, I'm not going to. You're not going to go I'm there. I'm not going to go the obvious way. Oh, yeah, you can't go obvious. You got to you, you say Zig, you go Zag or whatever. Does Herman Goring have a nickname? Is it like uh, the Iron Blimp or some shit? I don't know. Probably it's the Iron Blimp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, the iron blunt for sure. Um, okay, next is uh, David Flynn, twenty dollars. David Flynn, more like Nick Flynn. We're calling this guy Suck City. Suck City for all the memoir lovers out there. Yes, yes, yes. Um, next is Aaron Francis Levy. Oh yeah, we call this guy. We call this guy Ozzy Rules because 
AFL. That's Aussie oh, rules football. I like it. Mm-hmm. That was nice. That, that actually worked. Uh, Aurora Nibbly. Nibbles. <laughs> you can't go any. You, you gotta go Nibbles. Yeah, or the mouse. Yeah, the mice, the mouse. Mice uh, do be nibbling. Yeah. Uh, and then Thomas Van Hall. Mm. Call this guy A Team because he's always driving around in a, a van hall. Mm-hmm. Sure. And then look, finally, we love it when a plan comes together around yes, here. Yes, the plan. I mean, look, where else could you go but A Team? Um, finally, Monty S. Mm-hmm. The Royal Canadian Monted. Um, hold on. <laughs> Call this guy. Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns. Montgomery. Montgomery. Yep. Montgomery S. Springfield Burns. Mm -hmm. Mr. Burns. All right. That is your shout outs for this week. Uh, If you want a shout out. Uh, sign up to, at patreon.com slash broadcast. Sign up for the $8 tier. You will hear your name on Pod Yourself. I've done the wire edition. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, broadcast at gmail.com for all your questions, comments, and concerns. Vince, what is a Google Voice number? Oh, yeah. Subscribe to my stub, Substack also. Substack. Vince, Vince Mancini dot Substack. Yes, uh, vincemancini.substack.com. Please support our troops. That's right. And uh, the Google voice number, 415-275-0030. I just made another call uh, from our Google voice account to make sure that Google doesn't shut it down because they think that Google voice is a thing that people use to make calls for some reason. And yeah. they're very aggressive about trying to shut down your account, but it's still, uh, it's still up and still running. Still up, so. still running, still taking calls. So call that Google voice number, leave us a message. All right, everyone. Thanks again so much for listening. And until next time, if you come at the King, you your best not, not me. Flap, 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 and I beg your pardon, okay? This is a 
weird time signature, and I don't know how to rap over it. Uh, it's almost, you know, this has never been my favorite guitar solo. Uh, you know, this, you know, it just felt like it was uh, at a time when guitar solos stopped doing like 80s hair metal stuff, and that's fine. Listen, if that's your band, cool, listen to that. But for me, never really liked it that much. But whatever. Get some hair. have to be every time okay by the way i didn't mention uh because it wasn't relevant but you're talking about party music and i was like this is too much of a tangent but are you guys aware of like the fine you know you know red food from lmfao right Mm -hmm. yeah 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 are you aware of his like final single literally i can't no 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 no. (laughs) oh god so there's i forget how i stumbled across this last year but um like his career basically ended because he did the most misogynistic uh party song uh, with the the concept is he and um, T Pain and other people are, are like getting into or Lil John, not T Pain. That's racist. Mm-hmm. Um, are like at a at a sorority party, and they keep trying to convince the sorority girls to have sex with them. And there's a white girl saying is like uh, every time they they start to uh, tequila, I can't. Uh, shots, I can't. Yeah, heroin, <laughs> I can't. Literally, I can't. And then the chorus. Is T Pain going? Oh my God! Shut the fuck up! <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I found this. I like sent this to everybody. But it's like, it's like you can tell. Like even for 2014, people were like, "We can't do this anymore." Yeah, yeah. 